let's talk a bit about the COVID inquiry. It's a bit of a, a blockbuster week this week, especially with Dominic Cummings giving his testimony. Now, I think it's fair to say that most of the media and even the inquiry itself actually has focused on uh, Cummings' language. You know, excuse my French before I <laughs> say this, but he's called uh, various officials and politicians morons, cunts, and fuck pigs, whatever that means. <laughs> But one thing that we haven't seen much of um, is discussion about whether the lockdown was a good idea. I mean, Luke, what have you made of that? Well, I was listening and been following some of the evidence uh, recently, and there have been some witnesses who have identified how, for example, there was almost no regard paid to the fact that this, the lockdown would have a disparate impact on uh, women, on work, on the working class, on uh, members of ethnic minority communities, for example. That was just completely bulldozed. Mm. I mean, they do... It is really interesting when you listen to the questioning and the responses, they use the word COVID when they mean lockdown, yeah. which is really interesting. So they will talk about the impact of COVID. They will not talk about the impact of lockdown. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just to take a step back and, and look at the inquiry overall, it has now, I think, descended into a complete farce. Um, this is a very different public inquiry to one which would have existed maybe 40 or 50 years ago. Um, public inquiries have always been set up in order to investigate a specific problem with a judge and to find out whether there's anything different we can do to stop it happening again. So, for example, in the past, you would have looked at things like the Aberfan disaster. Public inquiry gives a series of recommendations about what can change about the law um, to make sure this never happens again or, 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 or as best we can. The COVID inquiry is an example of a, a more modern inquiry, which is effectively political, it's yeah. moral, it's, its scope is so vast that really... The, the lawyers in that room are being asked to adjudicate on the entire moral and political trajectory from day one of the pandemic um, into the future. Um, and for that reason, you know, the, the process is going to take two and a half years um, at huge public expense. And that, I think, is why we're receiving all this tittle-tattle about, you know, what Dominic, Cumming, Dominic Cummings called different people at different times. Um, I think it's broadly unhelpful. I mean, this is not going to help us prepare for a future pandemic. Yeah. An ideal COVID inquiry would have been narrow. It would have said, right, what can we learn from this pandemic, which we can apply in the future? And what can we use in the law in order to make that happen? We're 100 million miles away from that at the moment. Um, and I found it all quite quite depressing, really. And uh, I remember you wrote on Spiked back in 2020 why there should not be a COVID inquiry. And I think events have totally vindicated yeah, I think that's that, right. that view. I mean, Joe, I mean, Luke is right to say that this is political. You can see just in the tone of the questioning, who's in favour, who's not in favour, whose view, um, whose reputation the inquiry wants to safeguard, whose it wants to trash. Absolutely. I mean, I think the phrase you use there, tittle-tattle, is absolutely the right way uh, to, to pose this. This has been the focus for this week. But you think that's incredibly insulting. Mm. And the focus on um, swearing um, and, and kind of this so outrage that um, civil servants and people working at the top level of government, Boris Johnson's advisors, were using bad language in this very stressful situation and this kind of mock horror of what they were reading. That is incredibly offensive because what is truly outrageous is not the bad language. It's locking everybody down in their homes yeah. for the best part of two years. It was these petty rules and regulations that we all, all had to live by, you know, buying a scotch egg, meeting in a group of six, staying six feet apart from other people. You know, it was this petty um, regulations that govern people's lives and the power that, that a small group of people had to make those rules and, and the long-term consequences of it, we see more and more evidence of this every day mm. in terms of education, uh, NHS waiting lists, damage to the economy. And the fact that there is this inquiry going on that is not paying attention to any of that, I mean, is insulting. And what makes it worse is that we are paying for this. You know, not only did was there an economic cost of lockdown, mm. but we're now paying millions of pounds of taxpayers' money funding this political um, showcase. Yeah. Potentially, it's going to cost somewhere between 250 and 400 million pounds, you know, <laughs> getting up to nearly half a billion quid, uh, just to uh, essentially to relitigate uh, an existing narrative. I mean, it's so clear that the, um, the sort of lawyers in charge, the judge, they just think that we didn't lock down early enough. We didn't lock down hard enough. Um, the scientists were all brilliant. Um, they should be completely exonerated. 
the history is even being rewritten to make it appear as if they were pro lockdown back in March when they weren't. The reason we delayed the lockdown is because the government was following the scientific advice. You can disagree with that scientific advice, but that's what it what it was. Um, and Brexit as well <laughs> keeps coming up. It came up on day one of the inquiry. It was a key part of um, Helen McNamara's uh, testimony. She was the second, uh, you know, most powerful civil servant working at the time. But but you say it's being rewritten to kind of praise the scientists and and give due due respect mm. to the scientists. I mean that's true. But the important point there is like some scientists. Yeah. If you look at the way Carl Hennigan's been treated, I mean, the outrageous way he was held to account for things that, for, for the Greg Barrington Declaration, which, you know, I think was good and, and I would support that document. Yeah. But he, the fact was he didn't sign it yeah. you know, and he didn't write it. And yet they spent hours, it seemed, berating him for this document rather than looking at the scientific evidence that he actually had to, to suggest. Sinetra Gupta, another, mm-hmm. these are world leading epidemiologists. Um, who have not even been called to give evidence because what they were saying went against this dominant narrative, which you're absolutely right, is now being rewritten. And, and to bring up the bad language again, you know, they made a point of reading out a message in front of Carl Hennigan so that he knew that the people in Sage thought he was a fuckwit. To why? Work. why? Yeah, why? Presumably to humiliate him. You know, they, they question his scientific credentials, even though he's the, you know, professor of evidence-based medicine, mm-hmm. the, the head of evidence-based medicine at university, the University of Oxford. I mean... The treatment, yeah, the way that people have been treated differently according to whether they tow the correct line or not is extraordinary. And then in contrast, you have um, civil servants or sage people where they're basically given softball questions, you know, being told, aren't you brilliant? I think John Edmonds from Sage uh, was told, you know, you should have credit for raising the alarm, even though he didn't. What One extraordinary factor to remember about this inquiry is that the government ordered it itself. Mm -hmm gave it statutory powers to compel its own ministers to hand over these WhatsApps and these documents. I think it's therefore a fascinating insight into how the establishment is willing to tear itself apart and unwilling to toe the line. And that made me also think about transparency because one of the big discussion points around this inquiry has been, isn't it wonderful that we have this level of transparency and journalists absolutely frothing at the mouth at having what they call peak transparency. But I think it's going to be hugely damaging because now in a future pandemic, people will be very worried about making decisions in an agile and fluid way, which is was necessary. I mean, say what you like about the decisions that emerged. Yeah. I have no doubt that it was necessary to make decisions quickly, to not make everything minuted and make sure everything was through a formal cabinet, you know, gathering or whatever. And that people will be unwilling to do that. We will, you know, people will feel... And, and of course, had they made... Um, had they made decisions in any other way, had they not been in active communication all the time over WhatsApp, the criticism would have been the other way. They would have yeah. said, well, you were slowed down, you didn't, you weren't able to respond to events, etc. So I really think that the, the kind of damage that this level of transparency and scrutiny will do to our ability to govern is something that the government hasn't even reckoned with yet. Yeah, and if you think about how ministers will not be able to say what they think on WhatsApp in private communications with their minds on the inquiry, you know, when it inevitably comes. I mean, people were talking about this inquiry, you know, within weeks of it, actually, of the virus actually striking us. I know. I mean, mean, really, there should have been one question, were lives saved by locking down? Mm. Uh, And that should have been the only question. And it should now be possible to answer that question because we can compare excess deaths in countries that, that had strict lockdown compared to countries like Sweden, which didn't. And, you know, you should be able to do that very clearly and and very quickly. And this is important because if there is another pandemic, which there might well be, we need to learn lessons from this quickly. And the fact that we're not means we're just wasting our time. We're, we're playing these political games. And, and the answer is no, it didn't save lives, I think it's, it's fair to say, Absolutely. based on the evidence.